She was an outsider during the 2020 election, but after this Democratic presidential debate in Miami in 2019, she ended up being the most Googled person in 49 states. So, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a health care system in the United States. We have a sickness care system in the United States. We just wait till somebody gets sick, and then we talk about who's going to pay for the treatment and how they're going to be treated. What we need to talk about is why so many Americans have unnecessary chronic illnesses, so many more compared to other countries. And that gets back into not just the, health, the uh, big pharma, not just health insurance companies. It has to do with chemical policies. It has to do with right. Environmental Ms. policies. Williamson, your time it has expired. to do with food policy. It has to do with drug Thank policy. You. Thank it you. It has to do with environmental Senator policy. Senator Benedict. And after that, suddenly Marianne Williamson had created quite a buzz, a brutal one at times, if you ask her, but she has decided to do it again, building and refining her platform while pushing her progressive positions that she hopes will create a different presidential path this time around. Marianne Williamson joins us live here in our Washington studio to talk about that new path. Nice to see you again. Always good to see you. Thank you for having me, Kara. So you definitely created a number of Marianne moments, as we like to call them, particularly during that debate. Not long after that, you got out of the race. So what did you learn from that last run that you're going to do differently to try and sustain momentum this time around? Well. You know, you do learn a lot by being in the belly of that beast. You learn about what's necessary in order to wage a campaign that is a ship strong enough to take those turbulent seas. And I hope that I can do that. A lot of that will have to do with money. But a lot of it has to do with my own, uh, the emotional antibodies you get after something like that. You're just not as worried if the haters get on Twitter, wherever they are, even if on the presidential White House <laughs> press briefing podium. You just, you, you become wiser with anything you do, and you feel like the next time out you'll be able to um, handle the situation more powerfully. You know, since you mentioned it, you know, let me ask you about that, because Corrine Jean-Pierre, uh, she took a jab at you, talking oh, yeah. about <clears throat> crazy uh, balls, uh, crystal balls, magic eight balls. I mean, they were treating you like a punchline at that moment. Yeah. Um, do you feel you need to convince voters now that you're not? I think more voters see through the fairy dust now. I do. Uh, the American people are worried about their own health care. The American people are worried about the fact that they can't send their kids to college. The American people are worried about living on less than, you know, on less than $15 an hour and not being able to uh, afford a home. They're worried about the fact that they don't have guaranteed wages, uh, living wages or sick pay. And they want to hear it from anybody who might have an answer. And if a woman such as myself is saying we could have universal health care like they do in every other advanced democracy, we could have have uh, free child care like in every other advanced democracy. We could have family and sick pay like in every other advanced democracy. We could have tuition free college and, and um, uh, tech school. We could have a guaranteed living wage like in every other advanced democracy. I think the American people would like to hear whoever is saying that and are seeing through the way that the establishment wants to make sure that anybody suggesting such genuine fundamental economic reform is peripheralized and gotten off the stage. So I think people you, can see that now. How do you pay for that, though? Oh, how can you pay for that? Well, let's look at this right now. Our, uh, our health care system is about 18.3 percent of our GDP. When you look at Germany, Canada, countries like that, it's 10, maybe 15. We're paying for it now so much. You know, it's so interesting. Nobody said, how are we going to pay to, you know, make all those depositors at SVB, although I think we should have. I'm just saying that we never ask that about certain things. We are paying for the lack of universal health care now with our lives. We have 68,000 people in this country who die every year, Kara, because they don't have uh, because they don't have health care. We have 18 million people in this country who can't afford to fulfill the prescriptions that their doctors give them. We're paying for it now. We have 500,000 people every year who go into medical debt. One in four Americans live with medical debt. It's the cost we're paying right now that is not only a cost to our bodies, it's a cost to our souls. It's part of the great economic anxiety and despair that people are living with. The cost that we're paying, the societal cost and the human cost that we're paying right now, that's what we can't afford. But when you look at, at your platform with the universal health care, the tuition, free colleges, state colleges, universities, paternity and maternity leave, free child care, I mean, somebody has to pay for that. It transfers to the taxpayer. Well, no, Would it you raise taxes? What it, what, well, 
first of all, the people who have the money in this country should pay, pay fair taxes. In 2017, there was a $2 trillion tax cut in this country. 83 cents of every dollar went to the highest earners and the, and the, most, uh, and the richest corporations. Now, there was also a middle class tax cut there. That should be put back in, but the rest of that tax cut should be repealed. Plus, we should have a wealth tax. When you think of all the people in this country who make so much money that fair taxation, they wouldn't even notice it as they go about their day. And then you notice the 80 percent of Americans who live in a life of economic struggle year after year after year. Among other things, we then wonder where the mental health crisis comes from. You have 64 percent of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck, 60 percent of Americans for whom a $400 unexpected expenditure is too much for them to absorb. Why aren't we talking about them and the price that they're paying every single day for the unbelievable economic injustice that at this point is baked into the cake? Over the last 48 years, we have transferred $50 trillion from the bottom 90 percent to the top 1 percent of our earners. During the 1970s, we had a thriving middle class, and we don't anymore, and that's what we should be worried about. You said that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump ran on the economic anxiety of Americans and that they said to America, I understand your rage. So are you running on the same economic platform as Trump, but from a Democratic <laughs> perspective? No. From a Democratic perspective. More like, more like Bernie. So Trump and Bernie both said it, but only Bernie meant it. So Trump is the kind of personality, he's, he's, he knows how to get into you and say what you want him to say. So he acknowledged the rage of people with, with no plans whatsoever to do anything about it. He's the one who did the 2017 tax cut that gave it all to the rich or the vast, vast majority of it, right? Bernie said it and meant it and wanted to effectuate plans that would actually create fundamental economic reform. And that is what I will do when, when and if I'm president. You called certain Republicans <coughs> neo-fascists. Who are you referring to? I don't even want to go there. I, I don't want to personalize uh, on any of this. Ne when you start telling teachers, I'll give you an example. There is um, a bill, I was just in New Hampshire, there is a bill right now that wants to take any transgender children and make them li sit in another part of the classroom, that wants to say, that would say to teachers that if you see a child who you even suspect is LG uh, LGBTQ, Plus, you have to report that to, to the principal. You have to report that to the teachers and if, to the parents. And if you don't, you could be fined $2,500. That's saying that to the teacher. Yes, these are absolutely neo-fascist, authoritarian type of ideas. When you start telling uh, librarians what books they cannot have uh, on the shelves, you start telling universities what they can and cannot teach, Americans have to understand what neo-fascism is because it's that. Is it those leaders that you're referring to? Are they a threat to our democracy? Well, you know, when you say people are threat, I, I think we have to keep this away from personally demonizing anyone. We have to talk about systems. Yes, that kind of those kinds of policies are absolutely a threat Is to democracy. Is it Republican policies? Is it a Republican mentality? <clears throat> Look, I'm not running it. Is it? No, no, no. I know many Republicans who would never go for those things. Absolutely not. You know, Eisenhower said that the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. There are high-minded conservative values. There are high-minded liberal values. Nobody has a monopoly on truth in this country. And in a free society, you don't have to agree with each other. So at our best, we all, nobody has a monopoly. Everybody has some good and bad ideas. Um, I don't, listen, there are, there are many Republicans that I know who are very upset about the far, far right turn uh, of, of many, uh, many corners of the, of the Republican Party. But that's theirs to fix, not mine. You are, well, you'll be going up against President Biden. What is he not getting? Well, President Biden, I think, is a nice man, and I think President Biden is making some important incremental changes. But we're living at a time where we need more than the alleviation of stress. We need fundamental economic reform. It's not enough to say that you're going to uh, uh, lift the minimum wage. I already mentioned one-third of the American workers are living less than $15 an hour, can't even find a place to live. But then when the parliamentarian argued against it, oh, we'll just hide behind the skirts of the parliamentarian. Many people are concerned about climate change. I know I am. The president has given more oil drilling permits even than Trump did. And the president just today has, has given approval to the Willow Project, which is an absolutely catastrophic environmental 
uh, uh, um, uh, plan that will be happening up in Alaska. The president has said that he would do certain things that he hasn't done, whether it has to do with serious police reform, whether it has to do with um, <clears throat> anything having to do with serious voter suppression issues. The president has, like I said, he wants to alleviate stress. But as Franklin, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt said to Franklin Roosevelt, we need more than the alleviation of stress. We need fundamental economic reform. That would mean such things as universal health care. The president has said that he would veto a Medicare for all bill if it came to his desk. Such things as tuition free college. We have to stand for an economic U-turn in this country. And that is what I would do. And that is the, my, the agenda that I'm submitting to primary voters. An AP poll showed that only 37 percent of Democrats want Biden to run again. What's the concern? <laughs> his, his age, his mental capacity, what's the concern? Well, everybody has their own concern. We're a big country and we're not a monolith. But the point is that in a democracy, you should be able to hear as many voices as present themselves. I think that's the problem that a lot of people have. They want to hear what other voices are possible. I'm not taking pot shots at the president, Kara. That's not my interest. But some things are kind of obvious. It, 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 people have a right to say, thank you, Joe, uh, 2020. It's great that uh, you were able to defeat the Republican in 2020. But 2024 is a very different year. And I think that what we need in order to actually beat the onslaught that will be coming to Democrats in 2024 is something different. And most importantly, uh, the DNC and all of them uh, need to stop to stop making it so hard for anybody else to primary him. That's simply undemocratic. Nikki Haley says presidential candidates over the age of 75 Ugh. should take a mental competency that's, test. Do you agree? That's scary stuff. Why no. is that scary? Because, first of all, I don't think anybody's complaining about the mental competency of someone like Bernie Sanders. Um, what about President Biden? No. I, I mean, every individual should look into their own heart and make the decision. They can see him on television, and they, if they want to be concerned about certain things, they should. But Nikki Haley's idea of mental competency, I could say to her, some of you Republicans and Democrats need to take a moral competency test. And I would never say anything, because the very thought of anybody even talking like that about anyone is anathema to me. This is not the way to go. Absolutely not. Which leads me to, you are running for president, but your whole life you have been a best-selling author, you've been a speaker, you've been a humanitarian advocate, um, you've been a, an advisor to many people on faith and spirituality. How would you bring the core of your character into the White House? First of all, I believe that we should have a humanitarian bottom line. Our bottom line of the functioning of our government should not be short-term profit maximization for huge corporate entities. It should be the humanitarian values that I think are at the core of the idea that we are to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people, that God created all of us equal, that governments are instituted to ensure the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In that sense, we should not be run like a business. We should, we should be run like a family. It is absolutely unacceptable to me that in the richest country in the world, for instance, 12 million children go hungry. It is unacceptable to me that so the big oil can make a lot of money, we are denying our own grandchildren a guarantee that this planet would be habitable. It is unacceptable to me that 80% of Americans live lives in chronic economic struggle. There is no love where there is no justice. And there is not environmental justice, economic justice, criminal justice, racial justice in this country that there should be. In the book of Isaiah, it says, justice, justice thou shalt pursue, and I would every day in the White House. Final thought, if you had to go up against former President Donald Trump, are you ready for that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You tweet at me, Donald, I'll be tweeting at you. Oh, yeah. Getting ready. Gotten ready. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be enough uh, this time to be calm. Uh, this time we've got to meet him where he is, and I think that I'm absolutely prepared to do that. He tells some really big lies, and I tell some really big truths. Marianne Williamson, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.